like a Swiss clock, we're already starting. So today, upon the initiative of Mazar Company, Artsergen Global Compact in Ukraine and the National Bank of Ukraine, we got together to understand what ESG is and how Ukrainian business should include that in its strategic activities and in which way the financial institutions should evaluate the companies by these indicators. Our today's event is going to consist of two parts. The first one would be uh, the uh, experts uh, that are knowledgeable in ESG. And after that, we're going to have a panel discussion uh, between financial institutions and Ukrainian business, in which way they are already including ESG in their work, operational activities, and strategic activities. But to start, let us take a wider uh, where we're actually talking about ESG. This month, we had the biggest a climate event in the world, uh, namely COP26 in Glasgow, and we all saw ambitious statements made by developed countries as well as developing countries. In particular, almost 140 countries stated uh, that they are going to be carbon neutral until 2050. Developing countries determined this priority until 2060. But we all understand that this requires huge financial investment to change what is happening today. First of all, in the energy sector, because we should pass from from coal industry to renewable energy sources. And today we're already observing in which way the gas price is growing, which is actually a transitory type of fuel between dirty coal and clean energy, so to say. And we also see that countries, big countries, developed countries claimed how they are going to finance all these transitions. Europe allocates 1 trillion euros for the Green Deal. Uh, on the 15th of October, the US stated they are going to invest 1.2 trillion US dollars to deal with climate change issues. They are going to pertain to the transition to green uh, uh, automobile transport, renewable energy sources, and many other issues which are going to encourage business to change, not to allow climate change. But for the financial institutions to be able to invest in business, we need trust. How to build this trust? This is the question, how business should report so that it could be trusted. At COP26, they also discussed how to determine this carbon trace so that all countries understood the rules of the game. And not that like one country says that, yes, we decreased in this way, and but nobody knows how they calculated. And another country could just find itself in other conditions. That is why a single policy is determined how to take that into account. A couple of years ago, UN Global Compact offered the initiative of one and a half degrees, which requires from companies to set specific KPIs and to verify these KPIs to decrease uh, carbon footprint. And today, uh, what's also happening in UN Global Contact, Compact, the companies that report about their progress, if by the end of this year only uh, the publication of the report was required, so what good was done in the climate field or in human rights, starting from the following year, the reporting system changes and the companies also will have to report on their progress in numbers. Uh, the numbers in four main aspects, that's environment, human rights, labor relations, and uh, uh, governance and anti-corruption as part of company governance. 
So in this way, uh, we can see a trend for determining specific numbers according to which companies report, and investors can really evaluate uh, this company, not just on some uh, internal hunch, but to really compare them by numbers and by regions to make decisions whether they should invest in this company or not. And today, we have experts on this issue. In which way do we determine this ESG criteria? Who needs that? Who takes them into account? And in which way? And now I give the floor to our first speaker, Jana Ruzicka, Sustainable Director in Mazar, Slovakia. Uh, the topic would be best practices and trends of ESG in Europe. The floor is yours. Anna Ruzicka, could you please join us? Uh, Jenna, could you please turn on your video? We don't see you. We hear you, but don't see. <coughs> okay, uh, I will join you at my time, okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jana, could you please share your screen? We still don't see you. I will join you at 10.30. I have some problems now. Okay. Uh, it's 10.38. Okay, so I should be speaking now? Yes, please. Okay, because we have 9.30. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I was thinking that I'm going to speak in an hour. So can somebody show us, share my presentation, please? <laughs> Just a moment, we're trying to solve that. Yes, we will start it. Uh, it's on the screen. You may start. Okay, super. Okay. So, hi everyone. So, um, I would like to speak today about the drivers of uh, ECG. For years, investors had to choose between sustainable values or performance, but not anymore. Now, sustainable investing is paying off. That means that sustainable investing is uh, getting more popularity, also because of the new generation. Uh, because these young people are more socially and environmentally con conscious than their parents. Government is another uh, driver of ECG because they are establishing a CSR policy framework and <clears throat> they are driving CSR. Um, and uh, it's mainly because they need corporation to address so so socioeconomic challenges such as poverty, climate change, and others. Um, also, European Union now, now uh, will uh, ask a corporation with more than 500 employees to report their sustainability annually, uh, according to the special framework which is currently developed. 
Uh, please, next slide. Uh, so, um, another, another group are consumers. Uh, that means that, uh, that uh, uh, they, uh, they are more willing to buy um, sustainability produced products. Uh, they are more aware of the, of the issues uh, companies are uh, facing. And uh, they are actually voting with their wallets and consumer power. Uh, many many surveys show that uh, consumers are actually uh, willing to pay more uh, for for sustainable products. Another group uh, is NGO uh, and uh, campaigning groups who who are uh, actually mainstreaming ECG. They talk about the problems and they challenge the corporations. And of course, the media who are uh, covering the issues uh, and the coverage is uh, growing. Okay, please, next slide. Um, so let's see what are the challenges of the, of the leaders. Uh, while uh, sustainability... Uh, uh, as part of the core business model continues to be key to sustainability leadership. Uh, another important issue is also uh, setting ambitious targets and uh, committing to, for example, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, as we confront a global pandemic and uh, economic hardship, uh, uh, also, the social engagement, human rights, and uh, uh, health uh, is becoming uh, increasingly important. Uh, let's have a look uh, how, uh, when we said that uh, integrating the ECG into the core business model is very important, let's see some examples. Uh, what, how does it look like? So, uh, for example, food, a uh, food um, company can educate its customers uh, to limit use of meat in order to lower CO2 emissions. Uh, the finance industry is creating more products and services related to ECG. Uh, we talk also that ECG supports innovations. So... Um, um, I don't know whether somebody of you heard about the Mexico coral reef, but it's the first reef which has its own insurance scheme. It's uh, linked uh, to uh, uh, preservation of the reefs um, and the uh, payouts uh, uh, are paid in case of disasters. So hotels and private companies are actually... Uh, uh, understanding that uh, corals are bringing uh, mm, revenues and are also working as a natural break against destructive storms and hurricanes. Another uh, important side of uh, leadership is setting ambitious uh, targets. Mm, it's not longer enough for companies to reduce their environmental impact with uh, objectives, uh, uh, with objectives uh, that are self-set. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, companies are uh, uh, giving uh, incentives to the employees when the the sustainability targets of the companies are met. Or another uh, very good example is how to set um, uh, good uh, objectives regarding the climate change is that uh, you, um, you consult with the organizations uh, to help you to, to set the targets which are aligned with uh, the world, um, global goal, that uh, the, the global warming will be not more than 1.5 Celsius degrees. <clears throat> Importance... Um, Let's uh, have a look on the issues, um, how global leaders, uh, what issues are important for them. So you can see on the slide that, uh, on the graph, um, that uh, 
the importance of um, climate change and biodiversity loss is uh, steadily increasing over the last decade. Uh, it's uh, the blue line uh, showing the climate change um, with 95% uh, of respondents saying that it's a very, very urgent uh, challenge to see the blue line. In the wake of the global pandemic and uh, economic recession, Concern about the poverty and uh, access to health care are also increasingly seen as very urgent. Success of uh, business um, is also dependent on trust. Please, uh, another slide. A trust is a key asset for, for any transaction or relationship. Uh, reporting uh, ECG data can help you to address uh, uh, address the trust gap that exists between current financial reporting and uh, and uh, your st stakeholders' expectations. Uh, while they were only 20% of Standard & Poor uh, 500 uh, companies reporting in uh, 2011, currently it's over 90%. So we can see the growing trend. Uh, we also see the rising trust in the sustainability reporting around the world, which will be uh, even growing once uh, a third party audit will be mandatory in the EU. So it means that all uh, ECG reports, um, which will be published by the companies, will have to be audited by a, a third party. Okay, uh, please, uh, another slide. Uh, so last but not least, uh, it's, of course, important to be transparent, listen uh, to your stakeholders about their expectation, and uh, be ambitious. It's uh, really important to remember that um, ECG-led business approach is not intended to replace a focus on profit. It's a rather a complementary addition to the company business, and uh, it should increase the likelihood of higher prof profitability in the, in the long term. Okay. So that's it. Good luck uh, with the responsible business. And um, I'll be um, curious about some questions, if there are any. Uh, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was great to see the examples of uh, E, S, and G, how the companies uh, could uh, put them into their strategies. Uh, thank you for those examples. Um, uh, are there any questions to the speaker from the audience? If there are no questions, then we are moving to the following. Uh, that's Malgorzata Pekosik, who is a partner, an audit partner in Poland. And the topic of her presentation is how ESG creates material benefits when auditing financial players. My name is Mamgorzata Pekotik. I'm the partner from Mazars based in Warsaw, but I'm also the FS leader, so financial sector leader in Central Eastern Europe, so responsible for our region. I'm also the global FS advisory co-leader, so I'm covering uh, uh, the global scale of Mazars internship, uh, of Mazars uh, organization. So my goal for today is to present a bit of background of what the banks are doing uh, regarding the ESG and the climate risk. How are they answering uh, the needs of the market in that respect? And uh, to, to start with this topic, oh, sorry. Uh, we need to start a bit with the background. In, in Europe, the, the, the largest driver, the, uh, the strongest driver of changes in the uh, ESG uh, area for banks is actually the European Commission. So the European Commission uh, defined what is the sustainable finance. Sustainable finance is the term that is very important uh, uh, for banks. It refers to the process of taking ESG considerations, ESG factors, in the process of making investment decisions in the financial sector. So making the financial decisions, it's at the heart of the financial institutions, uh, of course. Uh, 
And uh, the European Commission believes that sustainable finance has a key role to play in delivering the policy objectives that we are mentioning even today. Uh, uh, the policy object objectives under the Euro European Green Deal and all the international commitments made in Europe. So the most important is, of course, that Europe is supposed to be the first uh, continent that will become climate neutral uh, by 2050. There is another commitment to decrease the carbon emission by 55% by 2030, so over the next decade, in comparison to uh, 1990. So all of these are very ambitious goals. And the uh, European Commission believes that the banks are supposed to help it, so supposed to deliver this uh, strategy. Why? Because uh, this kind of uh, ambitious goals, they require a lot, a lot of sum of money. The uh, European Commission calculated that it requires 350 billion euro every year just to uh, meet the goal about the carbon emission another 130 billion uh, uh, euro for other ESG uh, goals. So uh, it means that the public aid will not be sufficient, right? So the, uh, uh, so the European Commission believes that uh, these are the banks and the private investors that should support and lead the change in the ESG uh, uh, for the more sustainable economy. So although the banks do not contribute themselves to carbon emission, not so much, uh, they have the key role to, pray, uh, to play uh, to redirect the flows of cash flows to uh, more sustainable uh, activities. And uh, this aim, uh, it requires a lot of changes in the, in the processes of the banks, in the investment decisions, in the loan granting policies, and these changes are happening now. Uh, so what is the, uh, uh, how does it work in practice? Of course, the, the banks are doing it differently. It depends whether the, uh, the bank is green or not. It depends on the strategy of a given bank. There are banks that uh, in, they have the sustainability factor embedded in the, their strategy. So even the strategy is focused around the sustainability. There are, let's say, the BNP, BBVA, ING, so really like the go, uh, global players in Europe that are ranked top in any ratings about sustainability. And uh, what those kind of banks are doing, first of all, they are making the decision about reducing the exposures toward high-risk industries. In Poland, uh, it's one by one bank, at least the private bank, that are declaring that they will stop uh, to finance the uh, coal, uh, coal mining industries. Uh, but this decision, it doesn't need to mean that the, the financing will stop immediately. It can be done like there will be like gradual deduction of the exposure. They might be like, lowered, uh, reduced maturity of the projects, reduced limits for financing, so different measures taken to reduce the exposures for brown uh, and high-risk industries. On the opposite, there's increasing volume of uh, green financing, uh, especially contributing to the change in the energy sources, right? Uh, uh, we mentioned the, uh, the deduction of uh, CO2 emissions, so this is actually the, the main uh, thing. And the typical green investment around this topic are the solar collectors, uh, the photovoltaic panels, the heat pumps. So these are the, like the top uh, investments done in Europe, in Poland as well by the banks that are, uh, that are invested, uh, that are uh, financed by the banks, of course. But also not only these, these are, um, uh, these are investments done by the uh, SMEs, but also the retail uh, clients. Uh, they can get an eco loan for very simple stuff, like household appliances, like the eco wash machine, laundry machine, the LED lighting, very simple solution that can change our world as well. Uh, very popular are the mortgage loans for uh, energy efficient houses among uh, retail uh, clients, or the eco-leasing for hybrid cars, electric, uh, electric cars. 
uh, the banks create the investment funds to uh, to invest um, re resources in uh, in those kind of uh, undertakings that are beneficial to the nature. And very famous recent uh, trend among the banks are the sustainability linked loans. So these are not the loans that are focused about the uh, the investment itself that being financed. It's focused more about the debtor and the KPIs for the debtor. So the debtor receives the KPIs negotiated with the bank, and depending whether he meets these goals, let's say about the carbon emission or water uh, usage, something like that, f uh, this KPI uh, affects the interest uh, margin, right? So the, the parameters of the loan are depending on meeting the KPIs. Uh, and uh, the sustainability linked loans, it's not something that is forced by law. Uh, it's done voluntarily by banks, and banks are trying to push these kind of solutions because they want to be seen as more green banks, like with the green strategy. They want to act for the whole society. Well, not by coincidence, we say that banks are the public interest entities, so they need to act for the public interest. Uh, and the very last slide is uh, I prepared because uh, last week I had a uh, discussion with one of the CEO of the banks, and he actually recommended me this app, Electricity Map, uh, which presents the countries and how much the electricity, the electricity consumption creates the carbon intensity, right? So this is carbon intensity of electricity consumption. And the discussion was about how much is still to be done, or actually how much is to be done uh, in Europe. And as you can see, uh, on the left, there is a map of Europe with the green countries in the western part and more brown and dark brown in the eastern part. Actually, Poland is a really bad example uh, with the coal mining uh, energy. Uh, Ukraine is better because of nuclear energy used, but this is also because for this purpose of this uh, app, nuclear energy is treated as sustainable, mm, but uh, you probably know that there is a discussion around whether nuclear should be classified as sustainable or not, and this is actually discussed right now uh, by the European Commission uh, for the Delegated Act on EU Taxonomy. So we need to see how it's going to finalize uh, the discussion also for the Ukraine and other countries that are focusing on the nuclear energy as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, overview of uh, from international perspectives. Uh, it was really helpful. Uh, from my side, I may say that if we have investment component in the business activity, then as we say in Ukraine, it is very easy to work with the companies. They understand immediately why global agreement, why is your strategy, why they should do it. And this is rather easy. If they do not understand this component, investment component, when somebody demands from them to implement ESG uh, indicators, then that would be much more uh, complicated. And I agree with Malga Jata then financial, that financial institutions, this is the driver that makes company to uh, take this ESG strategy. So we have already discussed this international background uh, speaking of ESG financing. Now I would like to invite our next speaker. Uh, this is Yaroslav Cheka, counselor in Artsinga company. He will be speaking about ESG in Ukraine, energy and mining sectors. Uh, uh. So uh, as all of you know, uh, there was recently a UN climate uh, conference in Glasgow and Ukraine uh, promised to phase out of uh, coal and coal uh, energy production by 2035. So we'll see how that is going to be implemented 
as uh, now we are still not a part of INSOE, the European Energy Network, and coal energy basically plays a balancing role in our energy uh, network, energy sector, and thus still remains crucial uh, and unavoidable for now. Ukraine uh, also with uh, DTEC <coughs> uh, became a part of the past coal power initiative, was invited to, to join the industry transition initiative and negotiated with EBRD that by 2025, the financing for ecological or environmental projects will be increased by 50%. Uh, I also would like to, uh, to say a couple of words about our energy companies and their ESG before uh, turning your eyes to EITI uh, initiative in extracting industries. So uh, Ukraine is uh, supporting the green energy uh, as of now via the mechanism of the green tariff and I guess all of you have heard about the success of green bonds emission by Ukra Energo and their successful placement whereupon uh, 825 million euros were raised and these uh, resources were basically used to repay the green energy producers for the historical debts uh, of March to July 2020. Uh, but as of now, uh, we kind of um, going slower and slower in the direction of green energy as the green tariff uh, for the new projects uh, will cease its effect uh, in a year, uh, well, in a couple of months for solar and in a year for wind and the auctions, so-called competitive mechanism of state support of green energy is not yet implemented. Uh, but um, there are also quite positive steps uh, Ukraine has been part to uh, in, for example, mining industry. And uh, this is EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Uh, this is a global standard to promote the open and accountable management of oil, gas and mineral resources. So around 55 countries uh, have already joined. Mm doesn't seem to work. Uh, already jo joined the initiative uh, and Ukraine did that in 2013. And uh, since uh, then in 2018, so it took Ukraine five years to finally adopt the framework law on ensuring transparency in extractive industries uh, by which um, the majority of EITI standards were implemented um, and uh, as of now there have been already six reports issued by uh, Ernst and Young uh, under the EITI standards which basically outline the state of affairs in the mining and oil and gas industries. Uh, and if we uh, talk about who shall disclose the information under the EITI? Uh, uh, EITI uh, standards. These are, first of all, the, uh, uh, the companies which extract, uh, extract the mineral resources. Uh, then it is the Ministry of Energy, State Geological Service, and uh, their uh, receivers of payments. If we speak about the information which needs to be disclosed by the, for example, mining companies, and they should do it, uh, well, basically twice a year, but the most important report should be submitted to the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine by the 1st of September uh, of each year after the reporting period and uh, in its turn, the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine has 30 days to review and to approve such a, a EITI report. And the companies basically disclose uh, the total payments, total amount of rent payments, land use payments, and the environmental tax, 
they describe a type of activity in the extractive industry they undertake, production volumes, participation in social projects and programs, and they also issue a copy of the audit report. Uh, there also is going to be uh, a change because there is a draft law which has been uh, adopted in the first reading, number 3790, uh, which actually provides for, for several, uh, several changes. So uh, the three most important ones I outlined specially for you um, the full disclosure of all contracts between the extracting companies and the government concluded from the 1st January 2021, reporting on the amount of carbon dioxide emissions payment, as well as uh, moving to gender equality, which means information on the average number of employees with the determination of the number of employees of each sex. Uh, and the next, uh, the next topic I would like to cover is so-called ecological or environmental uh, audit. Uh, so uh, we, we have a special law on ecological audit which provides for voluntary and mandatory ecological audits. And this is obviously a part of ESG report and uh, such environmental audits are mandatory uh, during the state property privatization. And we've already seen that, for example, during the privatization of Bolshevik or uh, United Mining um, and Chemical Company in Ukrainian uh, OGHK, as well as we will see it during the privatization of Odessa. Uh, Odessa a plant, Opaza, and many others. And besides the privatization, um, if, the, if the government or the local community is uh, transferring the assets of higher ecological danger into long-term uh, long lease or concession, or is using the assets of uh, such enterprise for joint venture, for example, then the environmental audit is also mandatory. Um, and uh, the last probably interesting thing, the environmental audit also is uh, mandatory when the production sharing agreement expires. As you may have uh, heard, Ukraine has recently signed, uh, well, first eight PSAs during the first round in oil and gas industry, and now two PSAs with the Slovak company EPH, uh, or Czech company as well. Uh, and so since uh, these PSAs uh, basically, um, basically envisage uh, that uh, they will uh, last for quite a long period of time, up to 50 years, and the, uh, the winners of these uh, auctions, um, the extracting companies, uh, committing to, to invest, um, well, hundreds of millions of dollars after the PSA term expires, they will also uh, be commanded to provide such an environmental audit on how their activities impacted the local communities they're situated in and the entire uh, environment of Ukraine. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer uh, your questions of any. Thanks. Thank you, Yaroslav. Thanks for such a great overview of Ukrainian legislation and amendments there too. I think that this is what uh, we have in for us in the nearest future, and it is uh, great to be aware of it beforehand. We have talked about international trends, about Ukrainian legislative trend, and now uh, I would like to invite our following speaker, Arsen Makarchuk, Director for Strategy Department um, in National Bank of Ukraine. His topic is uh, National Bank of Ukraine policy on sustainable finance and development until 2025. It's very interesting to see how Ukraine is going to move in this direction. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, today I represent uh, the Central Bank. Uh, yes, the green finance is now very relevant. Uh, probably we should start from the overview uh, provided by Malgajato. Uh, but yes, tema uh, principle perhodu. Uh, but still the topic uh, for to move to sustainable economy development for carbon neutral uh, economy is raised all over the world and this is not new uh, we'll have to remember our uh, uh, even the Kyoto protocol which was signed in the 1990s they are still relevant uh, but now we also have a UN agenda until 2030, the Paris Agreement of 2015 and the European Green Deal these are the landmarks that uh, uh, the governments uh, are going to look up to, as well as supranational organizations and uh, also other subjects in the issues of economic development. Of course, we shouldn't underestimate the role uh, of economic transition to carbon neutrality and the green financing is an issue there and the role that central banks play to develop green financing as such. Uh, presently, this issue is uh, very actively discussed by international financial organizations and regulators. Uh, this topic becomes uh, uh, a priority for International Monetary Fund, uh, uh, the World Bank, uh, EBRD. It is also actually reviewed by BIS and European Central Bank. Like, For example, climate and environmental challenges become the reason for uh, and they have been recognized by European Central Bank as two main risk factors for the future. And according to BIS evaluation, it is uh, uh, ESG risks that are a source of systemic financial risks and can become the reason for the following global financial crisis. Uh, international organization uh, like uh, NGFS uh, directly points uh, to that in repeating the uh, conclusions that actually now, today, uh, the world is at the bifurcation point and it is on the efforts of governments and central banks as well as economic agents. It is clear uh, how it depends whether we are going to make a choice uh, until 2050 to switch to uh, zero uh, impact economies or until to, uh, 2100 we might get global warming three degrees more than normal with all the negative consequences of such event. Actually, as I already said, the new reality forces central banks to be more proactive and adapt to their regulations, envisage the development of financial tools which are to minimize the impact of uh, climate risks and according to the data I mean, this, this topic is also very promising from the point of financing needs, which we see. Uh, according to the data of International Financial Corporation, I see until 2030, uh, climate investment are going to require finance in the volume of about $23 trillion. And Ukraine's requirements in this case are no less than 73 billion US dollars to ensure those obligations which Ukraine has taken up, which are necessary also for transition to carbon neutral economy in the framework of uh, 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 until 2060. The National Bank also actively moves in this direction. The topic is now very relevant. Uh, actually, uh, every, uh, this week we conduct uh, dialogues with the countries we develop our own uh, network which is about the introduction of politics in the financial sector which is di directed at its screening and we actively involve the expertise like in the end of the year the bank uh, the uh, uh, national bank has become part of SBFN and uh, it uh, actually also talks about the expansion in the activities of this organization, this international organization that uh, combines central banks and um, international financial institutions and the experience exchange and competences is for the development of uh, sustainable financing uh, policy. This year, the National Bank acquired membership in this network for green and financial system, where we also cooperate in the framework of uh, working groups with other central banks uh, on the development 
of uh, regulation in the field of sustainable financing. On the 15th of April this year, we signed a cooperation agreement with the International Financial Corporation, which is a part of the World Bank. And in the framework of this agreement, we are working on implementation of a green financing policy. The first result of this agreement was developed and presented last week, last Thursday, the policy on development of sustainable financing until 2025 uh, that uh, I would like to tell you about today. I'm not going to stop in detail on the content of the policy. This is actually the first uh, news uh, on the National Bank of Ukraine. If you go to bank.gov.ua, you can uh, see the Ukrainian version of the news. In several days, there's going to be the English version of the document. But still, I'm going to describe it very briefly. This policy is a comprehensive document. Its mission is to form an integrated vision of uh, key foundations for sustainable finance and developing Ukraine and the necessary prerequisites for the implementation of this uh, with regard to consistency of state policy and adaptations of change to changes in banking system and the activities of non-banking financial institutions without uh, impact uh, on the risks of financial stability and also favoring the improvement of financial stability. Uh, the policy consists uh, of five sections and in the end there's detailed roadmap of those directions in which the National Bank is going to move uh, in implementing this green financing, the regulation is going to be ensured by the green financing. Uh, the general comment is to say that uh, the National Bank is going to introduce this regulation in a maximally consistent way, in full communication with the market, so that all changes are, are forecasted, clear, and also taken uh, by the financial uh, environment and also respectively by economic agents who cooperate with the financial system. Moreover, the National Bank is going to do that with respect uh, uh, to the provisions on commercial neutrality, meaning the autonomy of uh, economic subjects in their uh, business activities. But we also believe that now is the time to establish those minimal standards in which financial institutions have to act. So our regulatory events are going to spread to in four directions. The first would be the implementation of environmental, social, and governance uh, factors, ESG, in the activities uh, of uh, uh, financial institutions. So ESG factors are going to be obligatory elements of corporate governance system uh, and uh, in the management of uh, financial institutions when financing, uh, they are going to take into account the risks, influences, and opportunities of environmental nature, so potential changes of physical and or natural environment like pollution, impact on biodiversity, uh, uh, carbon emissions and the like. This is the first step that's going to be uh, done by the bank and as for the banks, we're going to issue our first document in the nearest weeks. As for the policy, this is the first quarter of 2022. But quite possibly it might happen a bit early. There's going to be methodological recommendation for now. That's not in a binding document, but recommendations on the National Bank on implementation of ESG in the corporate governance system. Also, uh, while the policy is valid, this document is going to be transformed into the provisions uh, and uh, publication will be a bit later. For non-banking financial institutions, uh, ESG factors are going to be obligatory starting from the end of 2024. Another direction which is envisaged uh, by the policy that would be uh, the management of um, environmental social risks. Uh, the uh, system, the ESM system has to be integrated in the general uh, risk uh, uh, management system in the institutions to ensuring something that is required from the system of risk management. That is uh, identification, measurement. Uh, control, report, and mitigation of risks, uh, first of all, environmental and social, which are going to emerge uh, when preparing and implementing projects which are fully or partially financed by such institutions. Uh, the integration of um, the set provisions uh, to the systems of risk management of financial institutions is envisaged for the banks from 2023 for non-banks uh, from the end of 2024, the third direction. That would be evaluation and selection of projects for financing with regard to the uh, sustainable development. So when evaluating credit loan projects, projects financed by financial institutions, uh, this institution has to evaluate whether this uh, project um, 
matches which are the economic activities match to at least one sixth of environmental goals, all for principles of sustainable economic activities and principles of energy efficiency as the predominant one. When doing selections for such projects, it's necessary to divulge information on technical requirements, uh, taxonomy and economic activities, environmental, social, and management uh, results. The respective recommendations on divulging such information are still being developed. And for banks, they are going to be launched in the end of 2023 for non banks also in the end of 2024. Uh, the fourth direction, which is envisaged by our policy, does the uh, fact that the banks have to divulge information about sustainable activities, not just about business activities, but also about economic activities. So how well the banks understand those risks which they take when they finance respective projects and how much should the activity actually corresponds to carbon neutrality principle. These provisions are going to be obligatory from the beginning of 2024 for the banks and from the beginning of 2025 for non-banks. It is also necessary to note that the politics include the obligations of the central bank to study and to, to draw conclusions about the possibility to introduce uh, macro tools, macro instruments in the development of green financing. Presently, not a single central bank um, has made a final decision about application of uh, macro potential instruments and therefore the roadmap for this politics also envisages that the national bank in cooperation with other partners is going to study this issue and uh, in the end uh, of 2023 they will be able to draw conclusions about the possibility of uh, using the in the development of this uh, system but also i'm going to say that not only the regulation but also the monetary policy are going to uh, pursue the development of green financing like esg aspects for the first time in the activities national bank became the part of the main requirements of a monetary policy which was approved in september by our supervision board uh, in the National Bank and it obliges the National Bank when pursuing this monetary policy also take ESG factors into account. In the end, I would also like to know that in the, we're in the beginning of a long way and we are proud of being a part of global movement towards improving sustainable financing and responsibility before our planet. I'm convinced that in cooperation with international organizations and in cooperation with the financial sector of Ukraine, we'll be able uh, to uh, have this high quality transition of Ukraine economy to becoming carbon neutral. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arsene. Uh, actually, it was very interesting to see, would be very interesting to see the document. Of course, I'm going to download it and look at it in more detail. With regard to the fact that we actually have businesses here, we have banking institutions, I would like to hear wishes from you, what they have to do already. Now, the document says that uh, what what they're going to do in 2023, 20, 24, 25, but to move towards 2025, we have to do something today. And what should that be? I believe that first of all, you have to change your conscience, your outlook uh, to understand that ESG factors are not just a part of business, not just regulatory load that's going to be put uh, by the state, uh, by a regulator, uh, there's the responsibility before your planet. And uh, it has to be understood and taken into account already. The earlier you start, well, at least try to take those factors into account, it is clear that somebody in this case is going to be more progressive. The simpler is going to be to adapt the new regulation when it actually appears. And uh, I would like to also express my gratitude to those who are already doing that now and who is already trying to take those factors into account in the activities. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, if there are no questions, maybe somebody else has more questions to, to Arsene. No questions then? Okay, and then we're moving to our following part of the event. Uh, today we have a panel discussion with those who, who are already progressive, those who already uh, have things to share. And I invite uh, Ruslan Spivak, uh, who is from Raiffeisen Bank Eval, uh, Olena Korobkova, ex Executive Director of the National Association of Banks of Ukraine, uh, Malgorzata Pekosik, who is a uh, noted partner in Mazars in Poland, uh, Aksandr Sesova, who is Head of Department for Corporate Finance in DTEC, and also Lena Voloshina, who is the Head of uh, International Financial Corporation Activities. Thanks for coming to us today. 
Mm-hmm. I'll sit between. Uh, some qu- uh, questions. What's going to be in for Ukraine from the point of Green Deal that we have joined and also from the point of finance that we can count on? Uh, Olena, probably this is going to be the first question for you. At COP26 in Glasgow, they were saying that developed countries are to be, they have to find country, developing countries, and every year they should allocate over $100 billion for such countries. Is there any information what that means for Ukraine, and can we count on any funds at all? And if we can, what of these funds can be spent and for what? Uh, good morning, everyone. I believe that it is not by chance that IFC is present here. Thanks, Torsen. You covered that part of our work, which we are doing with the National Bank. And really, we have great and fruitful cooperation and in participation of the National Bank in the, syst- in the SBFN system. It used to be SBN. Uh, but, uh, I would like to say that we're not just working on the National Bank on development of certain standards of green financing. Actually, for us, the ESG is something that is very close to our hearts, uh, that matches the spirit and the mission of our organization. So we probably were among the first who, in 2005, uh, back then, dealt with uh, sustainable financing. At that time, we did that purely in the risks aspect. We looked at the risks uh, whether they are sus- uh, and whether the business is sustainable and unsustainable. Then we went a bit further and in 2018 we developed a methodology uh, to assess corporate governance from the point of sustainable business. And since then, for 10 years, uh, the investments uh, in more than four and a half uh, billion dollars use that methodology all over the world. Ukraine is lagging behind a little. Now I'll move to Ukraine. And uh, we are now working jointly with the Equities Commission. We developed a code of corporate governance. This is not in the binding document again. This, uh, this is a document that could be used by the companies which believe themselves leading or they would like to become that. In this code, uh, we are now preparing some amendments to that, uh, which are going to deal with ESG specifically. Uh, It's going to develop uh, the so-called scorecard, which is going to help the companies to look at themselves from a side and will help them to correctly reflect the issues of uh, sustainable development in their financial reports. So answering your question whether we can count on uh, a lot of trillion dollars uh, which are available, We can actually just sit and wait for this money to arrive, or we can do our homework. And what the National Bank does, it actually does its homework. What the Equities Commission does, it does its homework. What uh, Ukrainian business is starting to do now, uh, leading companies which claim that they are going to be carbon neutral uh, by 2025 or by 2030, the main thing is that the companies are starting to walk that way. And you see, as um, um, a finance institution which invested during the last year, 10 years into climate project over 9 billion of its own funds and attracted 4.5 billion more from other sources. Of course, we're also here and we're happy to help not just to governance institutions in development of rules and policies, but also to help the businesses themselves. We have a special program which works, which is available for leading Ukrainian companies that would like to actually ask those questions of uh, climate and environmental components on a serious uh, basis. So for this money to arrive, we need to be prepared. Uh, The state has to be prepared and business has to be prepared. And we need to use people like us who are ready to help in this preparation. Thank you, uh, Ruslan. I see you want to add something. Yeah, in fact, I would like to add one thing. We 
I met with Tatiana in 2019 when, uh, after my uh, speech in the United Nations uh, devoted to uh, sustainable goals, including financial inclusiveness. Then we traveled to Kiev. We had a meeting in the American Chamber of Commerce with the top companies. And at that time, uh, in fact, I didn't see any project related to ESG, even from the top companies. Uh, two years passed. In that time, the world uh, hasn't improved, speaking of the climate, but uh, we have pandemic situation now, and all that risks were taken into account at the World Forum. And so it uh, resulted in supply chain uh, gaps and the uh, uh, rise of commodity price related to drought in that and this part of the world because of the temperature rising because of hurricanes etc it led to the more and more considerations on that so i believe that development developing countries they usually have chance to have this or that part of financial pie when they have a, a policy transparent defined clearly understandable for all the international partners they have understandable uh, sectors and uh, they understand that they are developing or growing to stick to that target and uh, of course we have certain amount of uh, requirements to have this program fulfilled that's why the number of trillion of dollars uh, allocated in the usa in the european union for and this topic is absolutely tremendous. So the question is, what steps shall we done? And some programs that was um, published by National Bank, it's of course a step ahead. And uh, speaking of clients, I look at them and they understand in their daily business and their global policies and their strategies for the next five years, they uh, allocate um, considerable part uh, they devoted to sustainable development in this part is growing uh, thank you my next question related to this what will be with the financial sector of Ukraine what strategies do you have strategies until 2025 2030 uh, who and what will be in the financing of Ukrainian business which way we have to act to get funding because Malgajat already mentioned that certain Polish banks they refuse to support certain categories of businesses okay I uh, start from historical data in RBI in Raiffeisen Bank and RBI is one of the leaders in Central and Eastern Europe speaking of is G finance speaking of uh, bonds issuance and uh, we have records in this area in green bonds issuance here by not the one not the first in this group and in the last two three years we are very active to get into that area into that field it's not that easy you couldn't just enter this process the um, solution is very simple you must be technologically prepared to that because the number of technologies existing today in esg it's a very wide range and the, unless you know everything about that technologies you just will have certain failures why problem in many countries in funding of alternative energy sources uh, because hidden tariff has discredited itself in many countries because of certain populistic steps and uh, specifics many networks the many grids they were not prepared to accommodate green energy and many banks they do not understand even now about all that um, processes what's happening now uh, we have uh, reciprocal movements from three, um, three sides, 
regulators, they set their rules, and each and every country make alignments to the frameworks dictated by regulators. Every structure develops ESG framework for themselves, develops certain uh, specific uh, uh, requirements. So, and if ESG is pocky, they make push in development of that policy unless all the uh, business lines in financial policy has the CSG uh, push, then nothing happens. Ukraine, within this year, in Raiffeisen Bank, we have very clear understanding that we must have ESG KPI uh, telling us that a certain amount of loans um, he should should uh, cover ESG finance. We have called thermal policy, and called thermal policy says that the majority of banking groups all around the world, until 2013, stop financing companies with a uh, uh, considerable part in their activity taken by uh, coal uh, production. So uh, unless we have this, we'll have certain. We will be to a certain extent uh, standing alone and uh, we won't survive in that uh, environment. That's why banks, they will do, and in Europe uh, the process already started, fund transferred price for green finance and the rates will be uh, lower. They probably won't be considerably lower because the Grivna is not that well standing now, but nevertheless, um, certain uplift I expect in this. What is the undercover problem here? The technical assistance, and uh, in this aspect, the great deal of that travels to uh, FI. It is very important that energy audit and similar tests and analytics uh, dealing with this or that technologies to become more m massive or more penetrative. Uh, we had nice policy, we had free of charge energy audits, but it was the beginning of uh, alternative energy era. Uh, in one day today, banks will not be able to uh, gather all the expertise in that. We need to have technical assistance because now we have a lot of biogas, biomass projects, waste management, gas uh, processing from the storages, etc. All the topics are crucial for Ukraine today, but to evaluate this technology, to understand that this technology is better than with this company than the technology of two, three other companies it is very difficult. And I understand that this will influence economy tremendously. In order for that to be effective and to make this as a framework and to understand that two, three brands Tractors, for instance, big companies, they have a great impact to the Ukrainian economy. But we must have crucial steps for that companies. Again, it is very important, the agriculture business, because agriculture business today makes great impact to the development. And agro understand it now as one of the major effects and this agro emits a great amount of CO2 as well. So we must understand the proper path and taking into account that agricultural sector is responsible for nearly 50% for the loans issued. Uh, this is one of the uh, sectors where we must concentrate our efforts to transform it technologically. In parallel with that production, unfortunately in Ukraine the production historically is not very well um, uh, within the last years. $370 billion, it is the required investments to a green sector. So we are speaking about 30, 40 percent of that will be the client's own uh, uh, impact in that, 
then we'll understand the money. So the future is great in this. May I say a couple of words about financial sector? In fact, if we are speaking about ECG, ESG, then the banking sector is one of the first in Ukraine started not only speaking actively, but implementing that. If we are speaking about investment uh, attractiveness of businesses, those that are actively promoting and actively implementing the ESG requirements and the uh, entities that disclose information on that, they will be ahead of the process. I would like to say what ba banks do in order to have benefits for their clients that not only thinking in that direction, but do something in that direction. There are not many of such companies, uh, scarcely you could find them in Ukraine. And if you say uh, have banks in one hand as creditors, on the other hand, you will have clients as borrowers, then the gap between the ESG implementation is very large. You means banks are ahead of the process and the creditors, they lag behind. And if we try to understand the financial situation or financial health of borrower, to what extent he is credible, then ESG, they don't have specific uh, evaluation in hryvnia or euro, but they have a lot of uh, points telling us if we shall uh, give loan to this borrower. And of course, the people that implement in all those requirements, they could calculate as well, or they could rely on a lower interest rate on that loans. But this work is very uh, complicated and we don't have many experts in the banks that could realistically evaluate or understand all that risks, uh, risks of bankruptcy as well. As well, I would like to say that there are a lot of, uh, from the HR, point of view to consider ESG in not only in banking sector, but in general sense, if any person is an expert in its uh, area of activity and he is not only interested in earning money, we're speaking about high income persons. They don't only want to get some profit, but they would like to be a part of something bigger. And from the company's point of view, companies that implement ESG and they uh, give this opportunity to everybody to become a part of something big, they have more uh, experienced personnel. Taking all that into account, do we have an educational program, training programs? Because we are speaking to many businesses in Ukraine. Many of them, they ask, who can teach you all that? For instance, in global um, uh, agreement, we have certain educational programs, but they are dealing with sustainable development. Do we have any special training programs in banking sector for the clients to understand the requirements of banks? Uh, look, if you have demand, then you have supply, of course. Uh, jointly with uh, IFC, jointly with uh, KF uh, Bank from Germany, we ran certain chain of uh, trainings for agrarians. Uh, we spoke to the bankers and to understand how can we do certain comprehensive report 
and how to submit it. Then we communicate it to agriculture people uh, to understand what difficulties do they have, uh, what challenges do they have. Next, we ran a set of trainings for both groups. We faced the fact that out of 40,000 agrarian companies working in Ukraine, only some companies work, uh, say, transparently. All the rest, they work in the shadow or gray sector in Ukraine. So it is very difficult to analyze their reports. Secondly, what we faced is when we are speaking about small agrarian company, in fact, we are dealing with one person who is a director, an accountant, a financial worker, etc. And he is an expert in agriculture as well. And we ask him if he'd like to have this training. He answers, no, I have the sowing campaign now. Next, I will have some fertilizing campaign, etc. They understand they need to be trained, but they do not have time to do that. And that's a problem. So we are ready. And uh, among our partners we have IFC, many, many companies ready to share the experience. But uh, speaking about Ukrainian mentality, we must slowly but surely educate people that they must do this. And in the beginning of alternative energy sources development in 2016, uh, we developed a educational program. We had two consultants in the energy sector, a couple of lawyers, several banking experts, and we uh, established a system of business launches, uh, business breakfasts. So we traveled around Ukrainian cities, cities millionaires. So it wasn't an exercise in advertising of course, a uh, side effect we could expect from that, like uh, new loans, new credits, but we didn't think about earning something using the green tariff, and you have only five years of this window to, uh, uh, to, to, to make necessary steps. But we were telling them that uh, energy fluctuations, some uncertainties in the energy markets, they were uh, expected at that time as well. We tried to give them some knowledge, and it worked nicely because awareness of client in one at least technology, and I uh, felt it in my client's audience, uh, it was very positive. As well, we are speaking about consolidation of efforts uh, jointly with IFC, with the um, National Bank of Ukraine, with other companies, with auditors. We start making this kind of umbrella centers, centers of competence, and meet people, share our experience with them, speak to them, uh, to say nothing about the small businesses. They add, area is absolute problem they don't think about that but this smaller part as well it the, the influence is smaller of that uh, sme company so we must start cascading and we're speaking about culture to change culture in uh, the companies we are building up and we start from the top management you should change their mindset and we understand the uh, say seriousness of the question the importance of that so we start with the key players next with top businesses and as soon as um, top business works with esg um, considerations then we could go down and down to the smaller companies so potentially it could be 40,000 legal entities and uh, entrepreneurs in this country they will speak they will say us we won't take your products if this is not in line with our requirements we will not buy your products from your fields change your machinery because uh, the emissions are great mm, uh, from that uh, outdated machines etc just 
buy something newer, something greener, etc. So it will be our cascade program. So in uh, past years, we understand that the top management already have this clear understanding, and this is our homework for 2022. I totally agree with you. Our global office has long been talking about the supply chain, and with our business, we start to, at least to start talking about this topic, how big business can encourage the suppliers like small and medium business to also be included in the implementation of sustainable development strategy, including the uh, actually the ESG in their work. And now, uh, then the question to you, Demagos Rata. Chain um, in your business in Poland, and what are the best practices? Uh, I know that my colleagues from Global Compact uh, Poland uh, work a lot on uh, Green Deal uh, initiatives. Uh, they unite businesses, they discuss different topics like uh, green hydro hydrogen, uh, battery storage, etc., etc., and they're extremely busy uh, to find uh, the best innovative um, cases uh, which are able to get uh, those uh, financial support from Green Deal uh, budget. Uh, could you please share if you have some best example, examples from that sphere? And what do you think about requirements uh, to supply chain? Uh, how uh, big businesses should report on their supply chain on ESG? Okay, so I think uh, first of all, we are all facing the problem uh, with the talents, like you mentioned. Uh, so, uh, and in uh, when you, even when you think uh, about the all conferences that are organized right now in the finances or any business conferences, ESG is the first, the most important topic. Maybe next to the digitalization for the banks. So. Uh, I think ESG is on the agenda of everyone, at least from the finance perspective, maybe not too much from the business perspective yet, right? But uh, I think the problem uh, is that there are not so many educated people and there, are, there is so much, uh, so complex uh, framework about the um, ESG that not everybody can follow. You need to invest time, like we said, to really be trained around the taxonomy, the, what, is, what the green actually means. And uh, there is not a lot of uh, understanding about that. And even the banks are uh, really facing problems with recruiting uh, talented people in this area because there was not... <laughs> There are not so many educated people in this field. There, it's everything news, right? So um, from the uh, Polish perspective, uh, I think we're at the beginning uh, of the story. Um, there are not too, too many projects yet. I think the Western Europe is much more advanced in that, especially in France. And the same with the, the reporting uh, uh, that you mentioned. Uh, the CSR reporting becomes uh, popular. It will be mandatory quite soon. But uh, there are very good examples, but mostly coming from Western Europe. So Thank you. Trends are going from uh, Western Europe. I see. Um, if trends are coming from Western Europe, then uh, uh, we also have things to be proud of. Uh, as there are companies have, that have already started with their best practices and uh, which announced about the strategy of carbon neutrality. And al also, I believe that I won't be mistaken if I say that DTEC was the first Ukrainian company that announced its strategy of uh, carbon neutrality until 2040. And today uh, we have Oksana with us, who is going to answer about uh, she's responsible for international financing for Inditec, and with her team she implemented the first in Ukraine issue of green bonds. I would like to talk about the way how to be a leader of the sector and the economy in general, how this is actually treated by Ukrainian audience, and whether it adds I don't know some bonuses in communication with. Uh, in Ukraine and actually thanks a lot for the question first of all I would like to talk a little bit from afar before we actually announced our strategy of carbon neutrality in uh, 2020 we're actually the first company in Ukraine that implemented ESG politics and uh, starting from 2019 actually we managed to do a lot in this direction and uh, also include our, our ranking. So in 2019 it was 
and we managed to improve it by three points and now the ranking is 26.6 that's actually a very good result also uh, taking account the, that we were actually the company that is actually does the coal generation and has been very uh, actively developing and uh, the renewable energy sources uh, i believe that we are the most leading company in this direction we invested about uh, one and a half billion euro in this uh, renewable energy source and presently our active portfolio is about one gigawatt and now we're building new uh, station actually uh, which is planned to be uh, entered into operation like that apart from that uh, also we are we we're also the first one to announce carbon neutrality strategy in 2020 but here i have to know that it's very important so it's not just you know marketing slogan how they call it you know greenwashing so the company first of all could really show its activities and could implement the events because the banks first of all they evaluate not just word they evaluate the uh, indicators and factors and we are actually moving in that direction but here uh, it is also good to know the problems. Many colleagues were saying that for the banks to issue the financing of ESG criteria even today, uh, they are actually among the main drivers to become eligible, to, so acceptable for the banks to actually get that financing. And uh, it is interesting, but this year, in spite of the fact that the company does a lot in this direction, even before uh, this uh, boom in the market started in the and uh, actually with the first company together with their Pfizer bank in ukraine uh, which uh, made a debut uh, green bond in ukraine in 2019 for 325 million euros again to support our green projects but uh, this year even though we are doing a lot in the direction is g politics and also announcement of strategy and carbon neutrality still the politics of banks in my opinion that's probably the question that i would like to discuss uh, is uh, rather strict and rigid it can be different from bank to the bank but still this year we faced uh first actually ruslan you first of all uh, the politics actually sounds so rigid that it limits the deadline when the company should achieve that carbon neutrality in the first i think this is the politics of 2030 detect this like is also i see that is a uh, coal generation even though we actually we have the share of green is 10 percent uh, by 2030 uh, the share of green is going to to increase and uh, and actually we're growing in this, this transition period because in business there is uh, coal generation so i also need from the bank some kind of support so that there is this uh, period and actually it's required to do it here and now and actually just uh, it's just impossible in the reality of our country and here probably as they said to have this prudent policy about that and understand that the company really invest and moves in that direction and this year we faced a problem that even if you come with green projects to the banks, building those, you know, uh, wind or solar plants, the company also actively invests in the innovation products like energy saving systems that you actually mentioned. We actually made a very small uh, pilot project there and now we're upscaling. So it would be great for the policy to be adapted to the reality of the business, even though for myself, I mean, it was really surprising from the point of the bank to only move from this from this uh, project and actually, which is directed at uh, carbon decarbonization, there are some refusals. And even we have these vectors in politics and carbon neutrality, there are problems. And I would like to raise this discussion among our participants, probably. Okay, let us do that. I waited for this discussion to start, you know, but actually, I really respect the position of the company because the company, I mean, I've been following this company for a long while and the uh, activities uh, and only uh, are just sort of respected. As always, you know, the banks, with regard to the fact that we are all for responsible banking, we understand that we have huge responsibility before the big number of uh, before the uh, contributors when something new emerges when we don't really understand that. So in the very beginning, we so we start becoming strict. We understand that we work in this corridor. The fact that this corridor and in parallel there are also those 
I mean, we're all ambitious people at this market, and we put ambitious goals forward. So in Europe and in the world, when they wanted to put up ESG goals, they didn't really take it into account that actually uh, some uh, kind of journey is going to be there. It's going to be fast and how hard it is going to be transfer. So that is why I'm going to say the following. Banks mostly, as they look in each other's windows and say, like, when are you going to do that? And nobody wants to be, let's say, less ambitious than the others. So on average, if we look at banking groups, that's really 2030. I'm saying that with all responsibility because I saw the strategy of top 30 European global groups, which on average uh, from 2027 to 2033, they move to uh, 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 this is actually the analogy that is clearly visible, like a COVID playbook. When the pandemic emerged, a lot of industries uh, found themselves in the red zone. This became clear because everybody said there's going to be lots of defaults, there were stress tests, they did it okay. And then there were three or four months, and they were okay, stop, we were too strict, and this percentage into industry, they can actually move to that. And this process lasts until uh, today, no. So in the beginning, no. Uh, actually, this is going to be the position of most financial institutions. Then they're going to see. Let's look at the latest uh, Glasgow meeting, let's say. So they have lots of, uh, they have lots of caveats. So the discussion that we had, like, uh, uh, but actually the politics uh, of China, Russia, the U.S., it says that this is necessary because if big players are unable, then small would be unable even more. The same is going to happen here. I think that in 2022, banks will be able to work at politics so much to actually improve this video opportunity, especially for the companies which have external financing, which are not from Ukraine, not, which is not from Ukraine. Because if we look at it, I see, believe that all this trend, that I would totally agree with our Polish policy, that the trend moves from the West. The companies that today have access to finance in the West, they are going to be the first one to change their policies, uh, get their rankings and so on. But actually all the other banking groups, they would just be the first followers of this politics. So in 2022, I'm sure that is going to change. As for the renewable energy project, just believe me, if not for periodic changes in the course, as for the green tariff, uh, this market would be tens of times bigger. And they wouldn't be cons uh, about concentration, oligarchs, and all the stupid things that they are trying to uh, put on us to actually hide the main topic. Because we want, and whether we are ready, that the number of the amount of energy produced in Ukraine restored is not 5 or 6 percent, not 2 percent, not 5 to 7 percent, but it's 20, 30 and more. If we want to have that, what are we doing for that? Because if the networks are 90 percent worn out, if the green tariff changes once every several years, then the credibility of this project from the point of the banks, and not even credibility, but predictability, is uh, very low. We have to understand what the payback is, what would be the ROI of these resources, what is the payback of technologies, because if in Europe, in zero rates, actually, everybody's going to be fine if in case of some challenges and the client, like for the fifth or seventh year, they would just extend it for two and up to 15 or 20 years of payback for some technologies. It even achieves 30. And they are totally comfortable in all that because if you look at 30 year papers from US, Germany, it's all clear there. So that is why we have we don't have the predictability like that. It is important for us to understand that we, there is this uh, tariff, it is preserved in this period, it uh, provides this uplift for money, the additional gross income for the client, and then we give the money for that. But unfortunately, 90% of the projects of the green energy in the last several years, due to the turbulences of the green tariff, I financed only when there is additional cash flow available. Why? the agriculture does not because they have different strong control. Why do the big companies do it? Because they have diversified business like DTEC, which allows to cover uh, using additional cash flow, those risky projects which are associated with the green energy, where there is indefinite, some indefiniteness from the point of green tariff. So this is the key thing. But in my discussions with the clients, I call them 
not to count on those revenues, but instead look into the future. If before, uh, like in now, we had this common concern ahead that we based it on this experience we built, the, but now we have to base it on the future and build this, uh, the present, because the technological thing, which actually, um, it's, it is so fast that the technologies actually are changing so fast that we are not even doing that. And actually, those technologies that were that are now as proposed and already tested in China and Japan, when this whole this different form is used and it covers, and it takes up much more wind. When, for example, the solar batteries use totally different efficiency uh, for that, all this actually looks on that. So it is important for the client to understand what to do. First of all, to cover themselves and to cover the region they work in. This is what I often work on now, clients, and say, okay, you just provide for yourselves, and it's surely going to help you. Because the problems of switch-offs, where the price grows for power and all that, everybody understands where the trend is going to. And uh, even if you look at that, of course, we're not in the bottom, even though we're saying that the price is on the peak, but still it is very high. And uh, to provide for ourselves like the, so that there is a sustainable development, it is necessary for those investments to be not based on green tariff, uh, but on their own need. And that's what we're going to work on. Uh, and uh, as a final answer to that question, I think in 2022, for sure the politicians would get a better way out. So thanks, you can actually be the speaker from DTAC. Uh, actually, I speak at your academy from time to time and the number of questions of different companies of the group which are about ESG. Actually, it makes me, uh, it impresses me. And uh, that's great. And it's with great respect that, really, yes, thanks. Uh, Manuel Volpe is actually our a rather outrageous Italian, who is the head of the innovation department in DTAC. So apart from uh, that, uh, we we'll look at uh, we look at alternative sources like clean tech. We we'll look at hydrogen. We we'll look at batteries and many other directions. Uh, so business really positions in these innovational uh, departments, and I hope that we uh, preserve our leading position there. Yes, thanks a lot. And now I would also, on behalf of. Uh, everyone to wish the Ukrainian business what to start from, what should be done now so that by 2030 we achieve our sustainable development goals and implement it all over ESG strategies and become carbon neutral. And of, after that, I'm going to invite everyone to the networking because this is what we are lacking in this post pandemic life. Yes, Oksana, let's start from you, please. So what our wishes? Well, probably listen to our children because the driver of all those events, that's them. The millennials made their contribution into the future history. We as a company probably have seen it earlier. So we started listening to the young generation early because started developing this aspect in 2009. So I believe that for, I wish all companies to hear where this whole world moves and to understand that it's not just some kind of strength, not just words, and they need to feel all that and put it through themselves to feel the importance of this uh, climate changes for us and first of all for our future generation and probably when everyone is going to feel it like that it's only after that that they will start moving their company in the right direction again putting correct goals, not just putting them from the point of achieving some carbon neutrality, but actually make bring, make actions, show those actions, and not to be afraid to develop in this direction. Like Sun said, it's not just profits for the company, there's also not just profits. So you see that we're developing Ukraine, now we're looking at the European vector of development of the green generation. So all companies, uh, I wish to do the same, and first of all, feel it through themselves. In fact, I agree with the previous reporter. As I said before, uh, the mentality should be changed. We must understand that we must stop and uh, make a kind of understanding exercise, not only speaking about that, but to develop uh, action plan in each and every company and start implementing that action plan. And uh, maybe the 
Education and training at all level must be uh, introduced. We should invite speakers from the Western world to implement better practices with their help. The best practices in Ukraine to take uh, them as an example for people to tell us about that. For instance, in Ukraine we have 71 banks now, and all the banks that are in the first 30, top 30, they uh, should understand that in ESG they uh, must be number one. And for smaller banks, uh, those words are only words, like UFO. Uh, as an abbreviation. So this is our reality and uh, uh, running uh, training in financial monitoring in credit risks, any activities uh, we must involve NSG, ESG uh, considerations in that for them to understand at least uh, what will be the best case in that sense, how it could be incorporated in uh, the global strategy of a bank. Because when the COVID crisis started, the banks uh, had as a goal, for instance, digital, digitalize in the next five years. And banks did it in three months, finally. A very fast process, and of course, uh, those that had money at that time, they did it faster. Those they that didn't have uh, some uh, spare amount of money to spend immediately, they are still in the process of implementing. When you'd like to be in the first rank, and if you'd like to see yourself in the map, uh, not only in the map of Ukraine, but in the world map, you must set goals and strive to achieve them. Irina, uh, look, it is proven already in my organization as well that the cost for attracted resources is correlated with ESG. Uh, component in the company. What I advise to the company to challenge themselves, to look at them from uh, aside. You may um, hire some uh, internal disruptor. You mentioned your Italian colleague that tried to blow up you from inside. Uh, you must understand what can we do better. We were speaking about environmental part, but ESG is social and governance as well. And since we have decentralization and territorial communities, they are more independent today. Uh, we must understand how to interact with the territorial communities, how to uh, achieve the situation when uh, some small business in smaller village or smaller town to be not only environmental but social and uh, governing properly. Ruslan, uh, I spoke a lot, so probably I give you only a short sentence from China. Chinese people, they say that between the sky, uh, heaven and uh, earth, the man is the maximum value. I would like to say that the road will be uh, taken by uh, those who go. So every company, every individual must set up a goal and understand what uh, he would like to see in his future. For instance, in Ukraine we have one of the dirtiest uh, rivers uh, shall it be preserved at that level or to recover, to revive the environment, to challenge yourself, what do I do for our future? It's not only the nice words we are speaking about realistically about the steps that will determine our future life. For two years we are sitting at home because of one 
only virus, but could be a situation when we'll have a very strong winds or minus 50 uh, in ambient air. It could be the another um, cage, okay, case. Malgajata, will you recommend something? Uh, the most important thing is to educate people. Uh, kids are being educated in the school, I think in Ukraine the same as in Poland. So from the very beginning, from the kindergarten and primary school, they learn about the ecology and what is important. And I think we need to do the same. It's more difficult in our age to learn, but we, we need to follow. And maybe from the financial sector perspective, I think the good thing would be to um, have some measures in the prudential uh, accounting. So like the reliefs, capital reliefs for the green investment, this would force um, more investment, like that and speed up the process of green transformation. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and my final probably words, sustainable development, what's that? This is the way the business is being run when the resources will be spared for the next generations. That's why I'd like that Ukrainian business to start or to continue acting towards the sustainable development goals uh, for our children and grandchildren to have something in this planet and something in this economy. So let us develop sustainable financing in Ukraine and I invite everybody to have a networking in that back part of this home. Thank you.